the study of Earth, Earth climate and weather. Um, as you may know, uh, today marks uh, 62 years uh, uh, old for satellite observations, where the first satellite that was uh, launched uh, by NASA was in uh, 1st April 1960, and uh, it was Trios. And the first image it took was about the cloud cover uh, over the, uh, of the Earth. And actually the, the very few first images were uh, above our region here with the Red Sea, you can see in, the, in, these, uh, uh, in these images. They were in uh, black and white, but we, uh, it was uh, normal images, not infrared. Uh, but uh, we were, um, uh, I mean, the scientific community were very excited that now they can see what is uh, above our heads from the space. So this was really the first meteorological satellite that was uh, uh, operational from space. And uh, since um, the launch of uh, TRIOS, uh, several other uh, satellites were launched. Uh, in the 90s, we reached around uh, 400 satellites. And uh, uh, around in 2020, we, are, uh, we have more than 3,000 satellites uh, observing the Earth uh, as, as we speak now. Uh, these satellites can uh, observe the Earth in two manners, or they have a polar orbit, meaning that uh, they will orbit uh, uh, in this way. And at a given point um, uh, on Earth, they will have a, uh, a repeating frequency, meaning that we, we can't have uh, the observations uh, in, in high temperature resolution over a given point because they will leave and then they will come back in, in one week or a few days. Uh, the other type of uh, satellite observations is with a geostationary orbit. Uh, these satellites, uh, they follow the rotation of the Earth at a certain orbit, at a certain altitude, and uh, so they will be observing the same area, but this time very frequently in time. So both satellites are very complementary, and they really can uh, allow us to uh, understand what's happening in the climate and in the weather, because the weather occur at a very short time. So this is an example of the NASA A-Train. Uh, we call it A-Train because these satellites are following each other, uh, uh, both in time and in, uh, in, uh, in space. So uh, here we have the Calypso CloudSat, um, uh, the Modest uh, Aqua and Terra, and then uh, if we continue in time, we'll have EarthCare and uh, other satellites joining this uh, orbit, polar orbit. Now, um, <clears throat> what is the added value of, uh, of uh, satellite observations, really? Uh, I must say that uh, the, the start of the satellite era, era uh, marked the start of the golden age of understanding the Earth's climate and weather. Uh, and uh, this really allowed scientists to understand a lot, a lot of uh, things happening uh, in the climate and in the weather in many regions that were uh, before inaccessible to scientists before the satellite observations. Uh, basically, we increased our capability to observe uh, uh, these regions, both in uh, space and in time. So instead of having only observations at a single point on the ground, now we can cover a very large area, the continent, the oceans, even the, the whole planet. Uh, we, <clears throat> we are allowed now to uh, access information about remote places, which were very difficult to monitor, such as the polar regions, uh, the wide oceans, the desert. And uh, the most important is that uh, satellite observations can give us continuous sampling uh, under any condition, uh, under any condition, uh, even uh, during the polar darkness period or nighttime, uh, if it is war or peace. Uh, so any condition we can have, we can still have access to uh, the information we need. <clears throat> Now, uh, in parallel to the development of satellite, uh, what happened, it was the development also of numerical uh, models. And uh, uh, in the 90s, these were, were two separate doctrines uh, evolving separately. Uh, but then <clears throat> in the late 90s, we figured out that if we combine these two capabilities, we can have uh, great benefits. Uh, and uh, we came up with a satellite data assimilation. What we mean by this is that we have our numerical model, which uh, was running alone, but now we will assimilate the satellite data into this model 
to keep the model very close to reality when it evolves over time. And uh, the result of this uh, combination will give us what we call analysis, meaning these are uh, model plus observations. And this really benefits the community uh, very uh, greatly. Why? Because we, uh, we now have access to information in, into a 3D uh, structure instead of only observational points here on this one. Now we have a 3D <coughs> coverage, so in the horizontal and vertical. And also we have, uh, we improve the model forecast. Now the model is not only running alone without knowing where it is going. It is always kept close to reality uh, thanks to the assimilation of observations. And uh, the most uh, benefit uh, <clears throat> from satellite observations was really uh, for polar regions because you can imagine these areas are very uh, difficult to access, very difficult to, um, to have uh, information about them in a continuous way, and very difficult to cover the, the wide, for example, Antarctica, it's a huge continent. So we can't from one single point understand what's going at, um, at the, the scale of the continent. Uh, the, the, the main, for example, uh, application of satellite observations on polar regions was to uh, monitor the melt rates of ice sheets uh, and ice shelves uh, by observing the ice thickness changes. So from satellite, we will observe how the ice is changing and we will estimate from this uh, the melt rates. As you can see here, the area in red are areas that are losing mass, whereas the area in blue are the area uh, gaining mass from precipitation and snow, for example. <clears throat> so uh, talking about Antarctica, I would like to uh, clarify a uh, few things. So Antarctica, we have three types of ice. We have the ice sheet. These are the ice that is sitting on the rocks, so it doesn't uh, move uh, from, the, from where it is. We have also the glacier and the ice shelves. These are floating ice, meaning that uh, they float on the water. They are not fixed to a bedrock uh, and they constitute a protective area for the ice sheet because they protect it from the ocean. Uh, in Antarctica during winter, we have also the, the, the uh, formation of sea ice. So the sea ice, sea ice is the ice that forms uh, um, at the surface of the uh, Southern Ocean waters. So it's really moving cubes of ice, you can imagine them. These develops during winter and then uh, melt during summer. But nevertheless, they are very important because uh, again, they protect in turn the glacier and the ice shelves. So um, one of the projects that we are, uh, uh, that we are uh, investigating uh, at NGOs uh, is actually the Waddell Sea Polynesia. Uh, let me explain first the sea ice in Antarctica. So as I said, here we have the Antarctic ice sheet and here we have the ice shelves and glacier. And in the winter, we have the development of sea ice. Now, after the launch of the first satellites uh, in the 1974, scientists noted that uh, there is uh, a huge area of free ice. There is no sea ice in this area. Uh, so they, uh, they kept monitoring it, and after two years, it closed, meaning that during winter, the sea ice formed again. And since 1974, it didn't appear again at all, until 2017, where again we observed from satellite observations of uh, this area, we call it Polynia, it's a Russian word to uh, say it's a hole in the ice. So uh, it was very intriguing phenomena, and... Uh, uh, scientists were wondering why, for example, it was absent during all these 40 years and then now it opened. So uh, in the group, we investigated this, um, uh, this question and we found that this was actually uh, the combination effect of atmospheric rivers and intense cyclone that formed in this region. So atmospheric rivers are these uh, elongated bands of clouds that you can see here in the satellite imagery. And here is the sea ice, and here is Antarctica, and the Polynesia opens here usually. So uh, by combining and uh, crossing different uh, information, we found that these atmospheric rivers, you can see them in the field of water vapor, for example, uh, brought a lot of warmth and, uh, and uh, heat to this area. And you can see it here in the radiation map. 
the long wave radiation. These are anomalies, meaning that the, the blue, the blue one is, uh, is very anomalous uh, uh, input of energy to the region. And so the sea ice uh, melt and also uh, uh, was prevented from refreezing due to uh, the effect of warmth and heat brought by the atmospheric rivers. These atmospheric rivers are uh, very uh, large scale uh, uh, features. They come from the tropics. So you, you have to imagine the long distance they travel. They come from the tropics and they, they, uh, sometimes they hit the area here. So now, as we understood what happened in 2017, we uh, went back to 1974. Again, thanks to the satellite observations, we were able to see what's happening. And we wanted to check if uh, the same thing happened when the first opening occurred for this uh, pollinia. And again, here we, can, uh, we could identify the atmospheric rivers coming from the tropics again. And, um, making uh, landfall or, or seafall, I would, say, I would say, in this region, and decreasing the concentration of uh, sea ice and uh, 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 triggering the opening of the pollinia in the Wadal Sea. So um, uh, you can uh, uh, imagine the, the impact of uh, this kind of observations on how much they enable us to uh, understand and increase our knowledge. Now, if we look, uh, we, we stay in Antarctica, but now we are going to look into ice shelves. So ice shelves are the block, large block of ice that are floating on the water, but they are very sick nevertheless. They are very, very sick, and they, um, they sometimes experience calving events. For example, uh, on the Amery ice shelf, which is on the East uh, Antarctica side here, uh, in, in 2019 experienced its biggest calving in 50 years. And here again, we uh, wanted to understand uh, what was the contribution of uh, the atmosphere into this um, uh, event. And we uh, combined this information from different satellite uh, uh, products. Uh, and we understood that uh, the cyclones that occurred uh, uh, at the front of the ice shelf. So here you have the cyclone and the uh, winds, uh, very intense wind, very anomalous also uh, compared to the record. Uh, they were um, pushing actually the water, the water in this side. This created a uh, ocean uh, uh, slope uh, toward the ocean. So here we have a slope in the water, pushing the ice, stealing the ice from the parent ice shelf which finally uh, led to the calving of all this block of ice. And this again is sentinel to uh, satellite observation, which give us the ice movement. So the arrows are not the wind here, they are, these represent the ice movement. So we compare two images and we figure out in which direction the ice moved between uh, two occurrences. Um, Another example for uh, monitoring uh, ice shelves, for example, for, for example, now we are on the western side of Antarctica and a, again a recent uh, calving at the Brunt ice shelf in February 2021 uh, was also investigated uh, in, in our team using satellite observations. And here uh, we can see this increase in the sea surface slope toward the ocean, meaning that the water uh, went toward the ocean due to the strong winds, and it took with, with it the, the, the front of the, of the ice shelf. Uh, here another example with uh, very dramatic uh, ice loss at the Pine Island Glacier, which also uh, sits here on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, and uh, from satellite observations, we can actually monitor the uh, increase or decrease, so the retreat or the advance of the front of this glacier. 2020 was the most uh, year for retreat. So we can see here the red curve uh, very deep into the, the ice shelf, whereas in previous year, it was almost here. So there is um, a lot of damage and ice loss in this glacier. And um, there is uh, some, uh, some uh, risk for, for uh, complete disintegration of this glacier uh, because of this damage uh, that is increasing with years. So this is the kind of information we can have now uh, thanks to satellite observations on uh, polar, polar ice in general. 
Now, uh, if we move uh, to the Arctic and the Greenland, so now we move to the uh, uh, to the northern pole. Here again, we have the sea ice that form uh, during winter uh, and stays from one winter to another in in, our, in the Arctic, con uh, as opposite to the Arctic where it melts entirely. In the Arctic, this uh, sea ice can stay from one winter to another, and. Um, but nevertheless, we uh, noticed a decrease in the coverage uh, and the extent of sea ice in the Arctic as well. So the yellow line is uh, the median extent uh, between 1981 and, two, uh, and 2010. And this one is uh, for 2020. So you can see all the area here now is open ocean. There is no more uh, ice covering this area. Now, if we look at the Greenland ice, ice sheet, which is uh, again, uh, ice sitting on bedrocks, so it's not move, it's not floating on water. We can see the red areas that are uh, uh, significant to uh, uh, melt in, in this uh, in this region, and some gain in in uh, in ice in the uh, northeast side of Greenland. Uh, this all again from satellite observations. Okay, now uh, what is uh, what is driving the uh, the, the melt in, in, uh, in the Arctic and the Greenland. There are many factors, of course, global warming has to do with it, uh, the increase in uh, the ocean uh, the water temperature also as well. But one important, uh, important factor is the ice darkening, the ice darkening. You know that if, uh, if you have a block of ice that is very white, it will absorb less the solar radiation than if it is dark. So uh, there is something happening in the Greenland, uh, which is um, uh, the deposition of uh, impurities and uh, aerosol and pollution on the ice, which makes it uh, so dark. And so it will absorb more the solar radiation and it will melt faster. Uh, one of these cases uh, uh, I studied here was in 2011, where a massive dust storm uh, uh, traveled from the Sahara to uh, Greenland and was deposited on ice. Uh, now, this is the effect in uh, short term, but there's also a long term effect of the deposition of aerosols on the snow and ice. And this is very important uh, to understand them because uh, as we know dust particles can pr provide uh, nutrients to small bacteria that develop over time in the snow and ice and if you look to some areas in greenland you see uh, you see them like that and if you have a closer look you can see uh, these uh, cryoconite we call them it's uh, uh, small black holes uh, in which there is the, the dust and also the bacteria that develop because they found food for them so uh, this is a like a lo long term impact of the dust depos deposition on ice uh, in Greenland because it will uh, dramatically decrease the albedo, meaning the capacity of the ice to reflect uh, the solar radiation. Uh, and here also a, a big contribution from satellite to observe the, the, the melt uh, over the Greenland ice sheet by measuring the brightness temperature. Uh, we have now satellite that can uh, provide us uh, with different uh, bands of brightness temperature, each of them are, are um, corresponding to water, water, for example, on ice or snow or warm snow. And so the darkest color are for uh, water on snow, which means melt. Okay, there is uh, something happening uh, now, today and yesterday, as we speak. Uh, today, there is something happening uh, from uh, the Sahara towards Europe. Uh, massive dust transport. So this is image uh, uh, taken yesterday by MODIS, uh, Terra and Aqua combined. <clears throat> um, a massive dust transport from the Sahara towards Europe with the position uh, in the Alps. So also the glacier of the third pole, which is the glaciers that are present in the mountainous area in the mid latitudes are also impacted by this kind of ice darkening. Uh, last year, actually, the same, more or less the same thing happened uh, in, uh, in February, and uh, uh, at NGOs we investigated this case, and again we, uh, found, we found that atmospheric rivers that are uh, traveling from the Atlantic Ocean, uh, crossing over the Sahara, are uh, actually uh, driving this massive transport of dust towards Europe and um, even the, the Scandinavian countries here. 
uh, the important thing was uh, to see uh, to see from satellite observations the impact that this had on the snow cover. Uh, snow cover for 2021. You can see here before the event, one week before the event, you can see the, the snow cover over the Alps, uh, pretty normal for the season. But then after these events happen in February, uh, at the beginning of March, it was reduced dramatically the coverage. Uh, we also measured from station the, the decrease in the depth of the snow. It was around 30% less than the climatolog climatological mean for the same period. And uh, you can see even that the snow is not that white uh, after this episode. Um, this is uh, just a few words. This is related also to the changes in the circulation in the Northern Hemisphere uh, due to global warming. Uh, Another capability given to us by the satellite observations is to uh, observe uh, long range transport of, of aerosol. Why? Because now we can have uh, coverage over a uh, large area. So one example of that was the Godzilla dust storm in June 21. Uh, this was a historical event because of the amount of uh, dust that uh, tra was transported during this event from the Sahara all the way uh, across the, the Atlantic Ocean to the Caribbean and Southern America. And uh, the other particularity of this uh, event, it was that uh, it was sustained over several, several days, around nine days, continuous emission and uh, transport and then deposition uh, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, from other, from other satellite observations, we can have, for example, here uh, the capability to distinguish between clouds, which appears here in orange and red, and the dust that appear in, in pink. This is from the Severi instrument that is geostationary, meaning that all the time is uh, monitoring this area at a frequency of 15 meter uh, min minutes, so, sorry, 15 minutes uh, at temporal resolution, meaning that we can have very high uh, 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 resolution in, in, uh, in time scale to understand what's what's happening with this sporadic events such as dust uh, uh, dust storms. Now uh, another instrument that is very valuable for uh, our understanding of the distribution of uh, uh, of uh, aerosols in the atmosphere is Calypso. So Calypso it's a lidar that is orbiting uh, 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 orbiting the, the Earth. And it has a, uh, a LIDAR, meaning that we have a laser coming down to the Earth's surface, and this laser will have a uh, backscatter uh, coefficient. Whenever it encounters uh, pollution or dust particle in the atmosphere, it will be attenuated. If it's cloud, it will be completely attenuated. If it's only particles, it will be uh, uh, partially attenu attenuated. And this, when we treat it, we can have uh, uh, the information where the dust was in altitude. It was here, for example, for this case, it traveled over the Atlantic Ocean at around five kilometers in, in altitude. And now if we combine the vertical and the horizontal uh, uh, observations, uh, we can have the 3D structure uh, for, for, the, for the distribution of dust particles, as you can see in these panels uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, these, uh, I repeat, it's from observation, it's not modeling, it's only combination of two products, one on the vertical, one on the horizontal. So uh, you can see how much uh, satellite observation now can, uh, can give new ideas and new perspectives. Now let's move to our region, uh, uh, where we apply also satellite observations to understand the climate and the weather uh, occurring in, in our region. Here, for example, uh, I will give uh, the example of uh, convective systems. You know that in our region, uh, most of the rain uh, is the result of the occurrence and the formation of convective systems. It's not uh, due to cyclone, for example, or disturbances like in mid-latitude, but more localized uh, due to convective cells. So this, you can see them from the visible here in white, but if we look into other products, uh, such as the brightness temperature, we can see uh, these cells in blue, and each color actually will uh, tell us uh, about the altitude uh, of this cloud and how deep it is. So a lot of information can be taken from uh, these kind of observations, and also it can allow us to have uh, to study the trends, to study the climatology. 
So these events, when they uh, happen uh, in, in the UAE, for example, they can uh, lead to uh, some flooding because they bring a lot of rain in short time. And I'm sure uh, many of you experience such, such events here in, in, uh, in the UAE. So now if we, if we take these satellite observations and we average them over the UAE, we can have a distribution, for example, of when these convective systems are uh, mainly occurring during the year. We can see that they peak in March and April, so the transition uh, season between winter and summer. Uh, this is a season where we have most of these uh, uh, convective systems, and um, on a daily basis, they are uh, more prone to occur during uh, after afternoon and um, early evening. Uh, why? Because uh, during these hours, the, the atmosphere had all the day to accumulate the water vapor and then to, um, to form these convective systems. Uh, again, we can, using satellite observations, have uh, information about the trends. Uh, are these convective systems and the rain that comes with them uh, increasing, for example, over the years or decreasing? So for, for this, for the area here, for the UAE, uh, luckily they are increasing, uh, and meaning that they are bringing more rain, more springtime rain to the UAE is coming with these uh, systems, and they are also uh, lasting longer. So the duration of these uh, convective systems uh, is becoming longer over the country, and the rain uh, becoming also um, uh, larger. So um, we can't speak about origin without uh, talking about dust storms, of course. Um, there are many uh, mechanisms that uh, uh, <clears throat> trigger dust storm over our region, but uh, I choose to only talk about uh, one particular uh, mechanism, which is dry cyclone. And really, without satellite observation, we uh, would have not even known that this uh, kind of uh, features exist. So uh, in September 2015, a, a massive dust storm occurred over uh, the UAE. And this is, for example, a uh, picture taken uh, in Abu Dhabi of, uh, um, showing the, uh, the orange sky uh, due to, to the high presence of uh, dust in the atmosphere. And uh, if we look to the satellite observation uh, for, for that day or the day before, we see that a dry cyclone formed here over uh, Iraq and then it drifted uh, southward. Uh, this is a zoom over the area. What is a dry cyclone? This is cyclone only, uh, dynamic cyclone, meaning there is no rain or clouds associated with it. It's only uh, the movement of the winds in a cyclonic way. And when we try to understand why this dry cyclone occurred, we uh, found that uh, it was due to, to the occurrence of a kata flow uh, from the polar jet. So this is a kind of uh, low that is detached from the circulation in the, uh, the mid-latitude, and it will dissipate over our region. Uh, but when it uh, dissipates, it uh, forms uh, here a uh, cyclone, dry cyclone. So here we can see the propagation of this dust storm uh, after formation over Iraq. Uh, another dry cyclone also occurred in, uh, over the UAE in July 2018. And you can see here the movement of the, of the sand from the empty quarter desert and the uh, large amount of dust emitted during uh, this uh, event. Uh, for this event, we used, again, uh, other products to understand both the, the structure of the cyclone, but also uh, the, the impact on the radiation at the surface, for example. Uh, so from Siviri, again, uh, the, the product that can allow us to distinguish between clouds and the aerosol, we can see here formation of small clouds um, on, on the the fringes of this uh, dust, on the top of the dust layer. Uh, and from Ceres products, uh, this, this is a, a combination of satellite products to estimate uh, the radiation fluxes at the surface. Uh, we can see actually here during night, a uh, significant increase in, uh, in, in, uh, in temperature at the surface, meaning that this dust during night caused uh, an increase uh, um, uh, in temperature and warming uh, in the atmosphere uh, during night. This is also was a new uh, finding for, uh, for these kind of events. 
Uh, and I think I'm done. Of course, I did not cover other um, other climate uh, topics, such as uh, the monitoring of greenhouse gases, uh, the monitoring of air quality, uh, many, many applications we can do now with uh, the satellite observations. Thank you so much for, uh, for your time and for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Diana. It was a very interesting uh, presentation, to be honest. Uh, now we can leave the floor uh, for our audience for questions. So please, if anyone has a question, raise your hand or uh, just type it in the Q&A. If you have any questions, please type them in the question and answer window. Okay, so there is a question here. Apart from dust, do you measure impact of the black carbon or on melting of ice sheets? Yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, beside the the measuring of the impact of dust, the position the position on ice sheet, there are groups. Uh, in, in Europe using actually uh, satellite observations to separate between uh, the natural natural aerosols and uh, the, the black carbon from, from pollution. And this is indeed a, a wide area of research uh, uh, also enabled by satellite observations. So the answer is yes, we can use satellite observations to distinguish between these two types of um, uh, aerosols that are causing the darkening of ice sheets. Thank you so much, Dr. Leana. Um, okay, uh, I don't think we have other questions. 